Welcome to Ending the Global Security Threats of Nuclear Power, Lessons from the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This webinar was recorded on January 27, 2021, five days after the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, came into force. Making a prohibition on nuclear weapons part of an international law happened as a result of considerable organizing by civil society. The effort involved challenging existing claims about the value of nuclear weapons and creating a new narrative centered on human security. It required building new alliances between civil society and governments and using international law and institutions to drive change. We asked our panelists, can these approaches help tackle the strong but subtle link between nuclear power and nuclear weapons? How can we halt emerging programs to build so-called small modular nuclear reactors, SMRs, and finally end the reckless pursuit of nuclear energy programs worldwide? Our panel of four international experts share their perspectives on the TPNW and the links between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Ray Acheson, from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, speaks about the keys to the success of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Zia Mian, from Princeton University, speaks about the limits of the nuclear proliferation management approach. David Lowry, with the Institute for Resource and Security Studies, speaks about next-generation nuclear reactors and the maintenance of military nuclear programs. Gordon Edwards, from the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, speaks about added proliferation dangers from next-generation nuclear power. This event was organized by the Raven Project at the University of New Brunswick and the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick, Canada. The event co-hosts are the Canadian Environmental Law Association, Beyond Nuclear, and the NB Media Co-op. We organized this event to address concerns raised about the proposal to build two prototype nuclear reactors, SMRs, in New Brunswick. The nuclear proponents proposed to reprocess used or irradiated fuel from the Lapro Kandu 6 reactor on the Bay of Fundy. Reprocessing makes the plutonium in used nuclear fuel more accessible, raising nuclear weapons proliferation concerns. We welcome you to learn with us from esteemed international experts about the links between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Hello everybody. We've got 62 people on, so we're gonna get started. My name is Susan O'Donnell. I'm the lead investigator of a project called RAVEN, Rural Action and Voices for the Environment at the University of New Brunswick. And we're also the Raven Project's a member of the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick, um, CRED NB, which is the host of the session here today. So I'm pleased to welcome you, everyone, on behalf of CRED NB. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm sitting here today on the land of the Wollastuck people. The Wollastuck is the beautiful and bountiful river, the St. John River. And I'd like to thank the um, water protectors for keeping the, the water, the river beautiful and pristine uh, since time immemorial till about the time I was born, a little bit more than 60 years ago. Um, and so I grew up during a time of the dream of limitless energy, uh, nuclear power, and also the terror of nuclear war. And we're gonna be talking about both of those today, um, each of them and the links between them. Uh, so we're looking forward to a really interesting panel. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to introduce the co-host, uh, st starting with Carrie Blaze from the Canadian Environmental Law Association. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone this afternoon to today's webinar. Uh, it's our pleasure to host alongside CRED MB and Beyond Nuclear uh, in welcoming our esteemed panel for today's timely discussion about the link between nuclear uh, power generation and nuclear weapons. My name is Carrie Blaze, and I am a staff lawyer at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. Uh, we are a specialty legal aid clinic within the Ontario-wide network of legal aid clinics, 
and we are funded by Legal Aid Ontario to work to advance environmental justice, prevent pollution, and speak for those who have been disproportionately and adversely harmed. As legal clinic, our priority is to work with low-income individuals and communities and to help them speak up um, in instances where they may have less influence or not as much of a say in decision making. We're very grateful to be here today and we look forward to hearing the discussion. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our other co-host, uh, Linda Pence-Gunter of Beyond Nuclear. Thank you, Kerry, and thank you, Susan, as well, for all the hard work you've put in to make this happen. Um, I'm coming to you from the nuclear-free and sanctuary city of Tacoma Park, Maryland, uh, where we occupy land forcefully removed from the members of the Piscataway peoples and also the Nakonchtank tribe, many of whom actually ended up in Canada. Uh, Beyond Nuclear, based in Tacoma Park, is very engaged with the issue of small modular reactors a phantom certain governments seem determined to make real at the cost of precious time we, we don't have and of course taxpayer money. Uh, we've prepared a number of handouts as well as a pamphlet about small modular reactors, all of which can be found on the Beyond Nuclear website. It's under the uh, publications section. Uh, some of these have actually been tailored to the specific needs of communities or activist groups confronting the threat of SMRs. So, you know, please do contact us with any needs your organizations may have. And you're of course free to download any of our materials and print and distribute them at no charge. So welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to hearing what each of our excellent speakers has to say. And uh, now back to you, Susan. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Carrie. Um, we have, it uh, looks like 106 participants online already, which is wonderful. We have some wonderful panelists here. And I'm just going to go right now and um, look at the bios for the first one. So first, I'm really pleased to introduce our first panelist, uh, Ray Atchison, who works with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom as the director of the disarm disarmament program called Reaching Critical Will. They represent the WILPF on the steering committee of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, which won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for highlighting the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and working with governments to negotiate and adopt the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. They also sit on the steering committees of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots and the International Network on Explosive Weapons. Ray is currently a visiting research collaborator at Princeton University and has been a 2018 UN Women Metro NY Champion of Change and a recipient of a 2020 Nuclear Free Future Award. Ray is the author of a forthcoming book about the process to ban nuclear weapons called Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, and I love that title, Ray. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, and, and thanks for having me on today. Um, I'm coming to you from New York City, but I was raised in Pickering, Ontario, just east of Toronto, and grew up a stone's throw away from the massive nuclear power plant based in Pickering. So this is uh, an issue that's close to my heart. Um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about how we engaged um, governments and activists in the process to um, reach the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and just brainstorm a few ideas with all of you um, of how this might apply to actions that folks might want to undertake in relation to nuclear power. So one of the key things, of course, uh, with the nuclear ban process um, that we did in ICANN was to refocus the international debate on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Um, so this really required us taking a feminist approach to the issue, looking at human security instead of state security, recognizing the gendered norms that lie behind nuclear weapons um, around identity and power and recognizing the patriarchal techniques and the gendered discourse that the nuclear armed states and their allies used consistently to paint nuclear abolitionists as naive or irrational or my favorite, emotional. 
um, and to really deconstruct and disrupt and delegitimize their arguments about security or strategic stability and nuclear deterrence and, and concepts like that. Um, and so in the process of doing all of this, we really connected to and highlighted the lived reality of nuclear weapons. So instead of allowing them to continue to dominate conversations with myths of nuclear deterrence and abstract concepts, we really grounded it in facts um, and examples um, and testimony from survivors and impacted communities from nuclear weapon use and testing. And we also learned from the strategies and the language and the approaches that these communities took, um, whether that was indigenous communities in the US and Australia that had been impacted from nuclear testing or um, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, it was really foregrounding their work and approach to the issue that helped guide ICANN's um, sort of messaging and, and strategy around um, refocusing on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Um, so how does this relate to nuclear power? Well, as you all know, there's long propagated misinformation about nuclear power, um, including that it's the solution to climate change, that it's cheap, that it's safe, all of that kind of stuff. There's also a deliberate attempt to diminish any concerns about health or the environment or the risk of accidents or the risk of proliferation and all of those kinds of negative things that we tend to bring up about nuclear power. And today I've noticed that there's even influencers on social media that are paid to promote nuclear power. Um, this has really been something I've been noticing recently and that actually some anti-nuclear activists in other countries, including the Marshall Islands have brought to my attention, but the nuclear power industry has hired um, in particular young women to promote nuclear power and to ridicule people that express concerns about nuclear waste or safety or security or any of these types of things. So this is something that is um, really weird and it's not something that we confronted with nuclear weapons. The weapon industry didn't hire young women to talk about how amazing nuclear weapons are. Uh, and I hope this doesn't give them any ideas to do so. Um, but at the same time, we did of course encounter the attempt of the nuclear weapon industry and the nuclear weapon complex to indoctrin indoctrinate um, women into the complex, um, the you know promoting as feminist the idea of having an all women missileer crew, um, for example, and things like the stories that you'd see in mainstream press like Vanity Fair really selling this as being uh, you know great advances in gender equality. Um, and so we found that it was really important to deconstruct things like that from a feminist perspective. Um, as Cynthia Enlow, who's a feminist scholar, always says, you can militarize anything, even equality. And so I think that is an important lesson to apply when we're seeing this new social media influencer strangeness around nuclear power. Um, and more broadly, this is the approach of reframing the discourse around the humanitarian and environmental impacts and the reality of this and making as much of the messaging and information as accessible and interesting and compelling as possible. Um, in ICANN with the nuclear ban treaty, we did this through new communications tools. Um, you know, we had a lot of really creative, talented people in the crew that made memes and did stuff on Twitter. Um, we also did a lot of really hilarious direct actions, which I think um, came through on Friday when the treaty entered into force. We have a treaty enforcement squad um, based out of Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, we did a lot of direct actions here in New York City as well. So we've always really tried to have at the heart of the campaign this humor, horror, and hope um, that we brought together in creative ways um, and really let different campaigners kind of take that in the direction they thought would be compelling for their audiences. Um, and we look for collaborations with other groups that are already doing this kind of stuff. And I think in the nuclear power realm, um, many of you will already have these connections, but one example that comes to my mind is Friends of the Earth 
Australia. Um, and they've been really, really great at doing a lot of compelling actions, compelling um, social media campaigns that make the information really accessible. And they have a really good partnership with the traditional owners of the land, um, which I think is why many of their massive battles around uranium mining um, and nuclear waste have been um, so successful and have lasted as long as they have um, because of these relationships that, that they've built over time. And then through governments, of course, we, we worked with them pulling together both massive international conferences and getting the Red Cross and UN agencies to, to speak on the issue and think about this issue. We also did a lot of smaller cross-regional meetings with um, core group countries that really wanted to advance the ban treaty um, and sort of schemed with them in smaller settings. Um, and here, of course, we were, we were aided by the fact that most countries in the world already reject nuclear weapons, but many of these same countries that were champions of the nuclear weapon ban treaty are supportive of nuclear power. So this is going to be um, something that's uh, trickier, I think. And even the TPNW itself reinforces the line from the Non-Proliferation Treaty about the inalienable right of nuclear power. But there are some sympathetic governments who object to nuclear power. Um, in response to the Fukushima accident in May of 2011, the governments of Austria, Greece, Ireland, Latvia, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, and Portugal um, as members of the EU issued a declaration in which they said that nuclear power is not compatible with the concept of sustainable development, and they called for a switch to renewable sources of energy around the world. Um, and there's, of course, other governments that are opposed to nuclear power in New Zealand among them. So it would really be worth for those of you interested in pursuing that intergovernmental approach to this issue, it'd be worth talking to these countries. Um, but these, everyone I've listed so far has been Western. So that's gonna need some work to diversify that, that pool. Um, I guess another thing that can be useful in some campaigning is to find compelling or known spokespeople. I'm really not into the celebrity culture around issues um, and we didn't do that too much in ICANN, a little bit here and there. But I did want to note that um, there are some interesting folks that have expressed um, really strong opinions and positions against nuclear power. When Fukushima happened, Japanese novelist Furuki Murakami um, issued a really, really powerful statement against uh, nuclear energy, saying that it's a vision of hell. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there that could be um, not quite from celebrity culture, but interesting folks to speak on the issue um, that could be good to work with. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most hopeful things about confronting nuclear power is that with anything that we're working on, it's always really important to tie in our work to things that are on people's radar. And I think in many ways that can be even easier with nuclear power than nuclear weapons because there's uh, a conscious direct link with climate change. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of folks that are active on climate change are looking at nuclear power as if it's a solution. Um, so I think a lot of the work that needs to be done is to, is to crush that idea and to expose how ridiculous and, and harmful that is but more broadly to make this issue intersectional, making it clear how nuclear power is capitalist, how it's militarist and patriarchal and racist and anti-indigenous and anti-environmental. And it can connect to so many of the issues and uh, campaigns and social justice and environmental justice work that's already ongoing. So I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities um, to really advance this, um, this work in this moment. So I think I'll stop there, but happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you very much for that. For those of you who just joined, we're doing all the Q&A at the end after all the speakers have finished. So I'm going to move on to the next speaker now. Zia Mian is a physicist and co-director of Princeton University's program on science and global security. He's part of the, it's part of the School of Public and International Affairs. He is co-chair of the International Panel on Fissile Materials, the IFPM, 
which is an 18 country independent group of experts working to strengthen policy initiatives to end production and eliminate stockpiles of plutonium and highly enriched uranium, the key ingredients for nuclear weapons. He's co-author of the book, On Making the Bomb, a Fissile Material Approach to Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. He received the American Physical Society's 2019 Leo Szilard Award for promoting global peace and nuclear disarmament. Thank you, Zia, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Um, let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking from Princeton University in New Jersey, which sits on land that is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. So for my part, I've been asked to reflect on a set of interlinked issues uh, relating to the global security risks from nuclear power, the limits of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and supply side controls that have been the effort so far to manage some of these risks and the challenges of the existing nuclear power order. So which is a lot to get through in a few minutes. So I'll be very telegraphic in some of the comments that I make. So let me begin by making the observation that the risk to global security from nuclear power was evident even before there was any nuclear power. The Manhattan Project physicists that were charged with building the bomb for the United States during World War II saw clearly that the technology and materials they were developing for the bomb program were transferable. In fact, they hoped to transfer the technology and materials from military to civilian use eventually. But they recognized from the beginning that it was inevitably a two-way street. And so they argued that in a future where nuclear energy was to be allowed for use, for peaceful uses, there would always be the risk of the diversion of civilian facilities and materials for military use in a crisis. And as I say, this was before there was even a single civilian facility for production of nuclear power anywhere in the world. So the physicists proposed, since they wanted a future of nuclear power, that in any future world to allow for nuclear power to not be so much of a global security risk, that two things were required. One was that nuclear weapons be abolished. And along with that, that civilian nuclear power should be under international control and not be allowed to be controlled by any government. So they hoped that multinationalization, internationalization, collective control and management of nuclear materials and technologies might mitigate the risk. But this hope you know, collapsed quickly under the pressure of the Cold War. And so the actual system that we have for managing nuclear energy and the security risks it poses it came out of the very first United Nations resolution uh, from 1946 on nuclear energy, which called for two things, the plan for the elimination of nuclear weapons, as the scientists had asked for, but also for a way to control atomic energy to ensure its use only for peaceful purposes. And the answer was that they proposed was a system of inspections of civilian use of nuclear energy to try and prevent it being moved from peaceful purposes to military purposes. And this was codified into what became the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty where under Article 6 of the treaty, the requirement is that countries that sign with nuclear weapons are required to negotiate the elimination of these nuclear weapons and other countries are allowed to have nuclear energy as long as it is inspected and monitored to make sure it is not used for military purposes. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, as Ray Atchison mentioned, includes in it um, a agreed entitlement where the language is that of an inalienable right of all countries that sign the treaty to develop, research, produce, and use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes without discrimination. And this is a, a right that some countries you know, hold on to jealously as a sovereign right. Iran has been very insistent on this particular language as have other countries. Another key element of the NPT that's worth mentioning here is that the treaty requires that all parties that sign the treaty undertake to facilitate 
and have the right to participate in the fullest possible exchange of equipment, material, technology, and information for the peaceful use of nuclear energy. So again, these two commitments that were agreed to in 1968 uh, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty are the core of what states have hung on to, the ones who want nuclear energy, as part of the structure uh, that shapes the international nuclear order, knowing full well the risks that these technologies could be diverted from peaceful uses to military uses, despite any system of inspections. Now, the last part of the non-proliferation treaty that's worth mentioning here is that it includes a withdrawal clause, that it allows countries to build nuclear energy and to be assisted in the building of nuclear energy facilities for peaceful purposes with inspections, but they have the right to withdraw from the treaty with all of those materials, technologies, and knowledge that they have accumulated. To manage this structure of the global nuclear order that has emerged in the last 50 years, along with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there have been various efforts at supply side controls where the countries that have the capacity to innovate and to share and to sell nuclear technology material and provide information and training have set up structures of supply side controls through the nuclear suppliers group. And that's been an attempt to outside the nuclear non-proliferation treaty to manage global security risks by re restricting who gets access to it, even though the treaty gives everybody the right to it. So this is a recognition of the limits of the treaty. But We've seen that even this effort has collapsed under the demands of national security policy. So uh, over the last 20 years, the United States in its effort to counter the rise of China has changed its own laws and forced the nuclear suppliers group of countries to change their rules so that India, which has nuclear weapons but remains outside the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is allowed to participate in the global market for nuclear materials and technologies which was previously banned. And the, U, the reason the US did this is because India was seen as a potential ally for the United States in the emerging Cold War with China. And so what we've seen is that even the countries that claim to be managing and upholding the nuclear non-proliferation order are willing to put it to one side when it suits their purpose. And so let me kind of wrap up my remarks by making two final obligations. One is that we know from a simple technical analysis that a nuclear program that is small by commercial standards, very small reactors, even no more than a research reactor capacity is still large enough to support a substantial nuclear weapons program. The second is that there is an inherent limit on how much sovereignty can be taken away through an international system of agreements because agreements are entered into by states and states jealously guard sovereignty. So if we are to deal with the global security risk of nuclear energy, it will not be done through a bargaining between states given their present interests. It will have to begin by pressure from below, driving opposition to civilian nuclear energy within all countries, so that nobody wants it and those that have it will be willing to give it up. And it is only through a phase out of existing civilian nuclear energy and an end of demand for civilian nuclear energy by those who don't have it, that you can create the conditions for states to agree a treaty that would actually make sure that no one in future seeks to make nuclear energy. And as Ray quite rightly pointed out, the ban treaty was drawn up by states, some of whom have nuclear energy programs, and they were not willing to give them up at this stage. And in Unmaking the Bomb, our book, we actually concluded that a phase out of civilian nuclear energy would provide the most effective and enduring constraint on the risk of nuclear proliferation in a world free of nuclear weapons. So if we want to sustain a nuclear weapon free world, a phase out of civilian nuclear energy at all levels and on all scales would be necessary. So with that, I'll end my Thank you, Zia, very much for that. Um, I'm going to introduce now David Lowry, 
He's a senior international research fellow at the Institute for Resource and Security Studies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, although he's based in London, England. His work focuses on nuclear power and radioactive waste policy, nuclear materials management, nuclear safeguards and nuclear insecurity. David's academic work on the political sociology of nuclear decision-making led to a 1987 PhD called Nuclear Powers on Nuclear Reactor Choice and a co-authored book, co book, The International Politics of Nuclear Waste in 1991. David was co-founder and director of the London-based European Proliferation Information Center, EPIC, from 1984 to 1997 and is, mem is a member of the UK Nuclear Waste Advisory Associates and the UK Chief Nuclear Inspectors Independent Advisory Panel. He has lectured on nuclear waste in a dozen EU countries and several times in both Russia and Japan. He received the Freedom of Information UK Award in 2004 and a 2001 Nuclear Free Future Award. So thank you, David. And I'm gonna be uh, putting your slides on in just a minute here. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. As uh, Susan said, I'm uh, speaking from uh, London, not from the uh, United States or Canada. I'd like to uh, introduce to the audience uh, in North America uh, some aspects of the small modular reactor program in the UK and uh, draw attention to some aspects that may not have come up in the debate, particularly in, in Canada. Okay, the first, uh, next um, slide, please. Uh, about a week ago, uh, in the British Parliament, uh, in the uh, Upper House and House of Lords, a statement was made by a minister, uh, which was basically uh, setting out um, the government, current government support for uh, small modular reactors, um, reinforcing the monies that they've allocated, uh, probably in excess of 400 million US dollars and their intention to support a program, particularly by the company Rolls-Royce, which I'll come back to. Uh, Rolls-Royce is known for its uh, cars, its automobiles, its aero engines, and uh, in the United Kingdom, it makes the um, submarine reactors for our nuclear powered submarines. Next slide. Um, earlier today, a company in, in North Wales uh, withdrew its planning application to build a gigawatt sized reactor on the island of Anglesey. Um, the developers of that site are now trying to encourage other alternatives to develop that site, one of which is a hybrid small modular reactor with hydrogen production, which is uh, emerging in various parts of the world for a nuclear industry that's dying and looking for new ways to uh, capture um, tax dollars and the tax pounds to support themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is explaining the company Shearwater wants to build this uh, um, project, which they call erroneously zero carbon energy, as mentioned earlier by, um, <clears throat> by Ray, that uh, nuclear energy is not zero carbon. Next, please. So what I want to do now is to show you three specific comments from uh, the last uh, six years, which demonstrate that the UK small modular reactor program is not entirely uh, a civilian project. First of all, uh, this is a quote from a, a document that was um, published uh, as a result of a freedom of information application three years ago comes from the British Minister of Defence and it's making it clear that the so-called Balkan report, Balkan is the test reactor on the north coast of Scotland uh, where the Doomray uh, fast reactor program is based and um, they made it clear in this report that they would like to um, take advantage of what they call emergent civil new build programs which became the small modular reactor program. Next slide please. Uh, this is a, a citation from a report from three years ago produced by uh, Rolls-Royce and uh, it is trying to sell the concept of a small modular reactor to um, co-investors and to the UK government. And what is pretty clear from this document, and it's really quite surprising that they're so blatant, watching in red the 
um, admission by Rolls-Royce that they see this program as a complete blurring of the, of the long-standing distinction between civilian and military nuclear programs. Um, Rolls-Royce has made its uh, nuclear name in the nuclear Navy, uh, sees an opportunity with the contraction, particularly of the uh, aerospace engines and its um, automobile section, and now it's trying to find new markets. And this is where it's pumping for new market in the small modular reactor. As uh, so you can see from these two quotations I've highlighted, the, um, the, the Rolls-Royce management see uh, having a mixed civilian military program for their small modular reactor program. Next slide, please. And uh, this was endorsed um, a couple of months after that report came out from Rolls-Royce by the head of the, um, the civil servant head of the British Ministry of Defence, who told the parliamentary committee quite blatantly, as far as he was concerned, that the skill-based in the UK nuclear energy industry should be used jointly for civilian and military development. And uh, as I've highlighted here, he says there's very definitely an opportunity for the nation to grasp in terms of building up its nuclear skills. And that's nuclear skills for the defense program, the weapons program, the, the nuclear submarine program, and the uh, next generation, as they would see it, of nuclear power reactors, which they call either small modular reactors or uh, advanced uh, modular reactors. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last citation from government. This is the you know, ex-energy minister who made it pretty clear in the parliamentary debate looking at the so-called nuclear sector deal that um, the government wanted to have the uh, Minister of Defense and the uh, civilian nuclear industry um, co collaborating together so they could build up the joint skill base to support both programs. And uh, as I said, after decades of arguing that there should be an absolute rigid distinction between civil and military nuclear activities, we now see very clearly uh, British officials and British ministers arguing the opposite. Thank you, next. Uh, I tried to find out um, how the uh, National Nuclear Skills Forum was being used to jointly develop skills that would be able to be used both for the military nuclear program and the new emergent small modular reactor program. I put in uh, an application under the Freedom of Information Act and you can see the question I asked for the background documents to the meetings. I got an answer a couple of days ago and I've just highlighted one section from the answer where the government considered that my uh, request would not be answered because, and I quote, your request is due to disproportionate level of disruption the government's mainstream activities. I wish my interventions could actually cause such an disruption of government activities, but it's rather interesting to me that rather than provide the information, they ducked under what I think is a spurious uh, refusal. Next, please. Um, I just wanted to bring your attention that it's not just in the UK where there's now been a blurring of the civil and military activity with regard to small modular reactors. This is from a, uh, an order issued by uh, President Trump. Actually, the date on it is the 12th of January, but actually he signed the order on the, on the 5th of January, the day before he authorized a mass scale attack on his own um, parliament at the, at the US, uh, US Capitol. So anyway, he basically assigned a, um, a presidential executive order where he wanted the um, benefits of nuclear energy to go together with the benefits of so-called military nuclear so they could develop small border reactors for both national defense and space exploration. So the United States is now also blurring the distinction between civil and military activities. Next, please. This is an example from one of many promotional um, presentations for what a small modular reactor would look like. Actually, they're not that small. If you see the, the, uh, the car parking area at the front for the reactor, and then you compare that with the reactor, the reactor itself is not actually that small, but it's not that well protected. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to show you that they, they, they are, there are at least 50 potential designs for uh, small modular reactors. This is taken from um, five years ago from a British professor, and that's just a long, long list of uh, names of reactor types that could possibly be developed into 
small model of reactors. If my if I was in a bet, I would bet that no more than about one or two of them ever get anywhere near a commercial development. Next, please. So this is uh, another uh, schematic representation of a small modular reactor. And the reason why I show you this and bring it to your attention is if you look at the fence surrounding this uh, reactor, it's really quite small, quite low. And uh, in my view, doesn't uh, provide much protection. Uh, and just to demonstrate how, how you could actually um, disrupt uh, with um, uh, very significant effect a small model reactor with a uh, malevolent attack from a, a group. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a Raytheon uh, film from a promotional film. They're trying to show you how powerful their weapon systems are. So if the weapon system that they're trying to sell here were to be used against a hardened um, small modular reactor without any kind of protective uh, external fence. Next slide, this is what happens. Thank you very much. I don't regard them as a particularly well defended technology or necessary or, or desirable and, and I hope they don't go any further. Last slide, please. I particularly want to thank two British academics, uh, Professor Sterling and Dr. Johnson for their excellent work on this project. And I, I would recommend anybody wanting to follow this up further, uh, go to those two academics who have just about every bit of knowledge you want on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for that. So we've just got, uh, obviously not last but not least, Gordon Edwards, who's very well known to many of us, not only in Canada, but internationally as well. And I'd just like to um, read Gordon's bio. Gordon Edwards is co-founder and president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. Gordon is a scientist and nuclear consultant with a background in mathematics, physics, and literature, English literature. He has written articles and reports on radiation standards, radioactive wastes, uranium mining, nuclear proliferation, the economics of nuclear power, and non-nuclear energy strategies. Gordon has been featured on many radio and television programs and has worked as a consultant for governmental bodies. He's currently working with activists across Canada on national and local campaigns against new nuclear reactors and for responsible stewardship of the radioactive waste legacy of the nuclear age. In 2006, Gordon received the Nuclear Free Future Award. He has also been awarded the Rosalie Bertel Lifetime Achievement Award and the YMCA Peacemaker Medallion. So thank you, Gordon. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this uh, meeting. Um, just as uh, David Lowry has commented on the, uh, um, the personnel and the political implications of merging the peaceful atom and the military atom, as it were, I'd like to focus on the materials used in nuclear weapons. This is a model of a uranium atom. Uranium is the key element for all nuclear fission technology, whether military or civilian. It is the only naturally occurring material which can be used to make an atomic bomb. Without uranium, there would be no nuclear weapons of any description, or nuclear reactors either, for that matter. Um, the, in order to be used as a bomb, uranium can't be used as it comes out of the ground. It has to be highly enriched, and that takes place at Oak Ridge, where that model was built. Here we see the city of Hiroshima destroyed by an, a uranium bomb called Little Boy on August 6, 1945. And just three days later, the city of Nagasaki was destroyed by another bomb, not made of uranium, but made of plutonium, which is a, not, does not occur in nature the way uranium does. Plutonium is all man-made, human-made. And in fact, it's a derivative of uranium which is produced as a byproduct in all nuclear reactors, whether civilian or military. Uh, one thing about plutonium is that it, all types of plutonium can be used for nuclear weapons, whereas uranium, not all kinds of uranium can be used for nuclear weapons. Consequently, it's more difficult to manage the plutonium that we have created because we do not know how to denature it. We do not know how to make it unusable. We do know how to take enriched uranium and blend it back down to unenriched uranium, which can't be directly used for an atomic weapon. So there's a difference there, which is quite significant. 
The reason why the shapes are different, the reason they're called little boy and uh, fat man is because the Hiroshima bomb is extremely simple. It's basically just a gun where they fire one piece of highly enriched uranium into another and boom, there goes the city. Where with the plutonium bomb, it's more complicated for technical reasons and they have to use an implosion mechanism. The Hiroshima bomb was so simple in design that they did not have to test it. They knew it would work. The plutonium bomb they tested in the Nevada desert. This is the size of a ball of plutonium that will destroy a city. It's only 6.2 kilograms of plutonium and every civilian nuclear reactor produces enough plutonium for many bombs every single year of its operation. So uh, we, we could build with our spent fuel from Canada, we could build tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. And that is true for thousands of years to come because plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. So we are literally in spreading plutonium around the world, which is true whenever we spread civilian nuclear power around the world, we're literally planting the seeds that can be used by any future regime to build nuclear arsenals. What does that mean for a nuclear weapons free world? It means a high degree of instability and whether it's even possible to have a nuclear weapons free world depends on controlling and putting an end to the production of these materials. Even H-bombs much more powerful that use nuclear fusion depend upon plutonium as a trigger. Without plutonium, you can't ignite the, the fusion reaction and consequently you can't get the enormous explosion from fusion. That is the power that, that uh, fuels the sun and the stars that we see in the sky at night. When they dismantle nuclear weapons, what they're talking about is simply taking the plutonium out of the warhead. That's what dismantling the nuclear weapon primarily means. Then it's useless. Now with uranium, as I said, it's quite different. You have to enrich it and this is not an easy thing to do. I would like you to imagine a mountain of salt with a small amount of pepper mixed in with it. And you are given a pair of tweezers and your job is to gradually one by one remove all the salt particles in order to end up with a concentrated amount of pepper. Well, that's easier than enriching uranium. And this plant uh, is a Paducah plant. It's one of the largest structures on the, on the earth. It's visible from space. It uses as much energy as a large city and its only purpose is to enrich uranium. Now, in order to enrich uranium, if you go back to the salt and pepper analogy, you have to throw away an awful lot of salt in order to get that small amount of concentrated pepper. Well, this is the salt. It's the depleted uranium. It's mostly uranium-238, which is called the non-explosive type of uranium. Although that's not strictly true, as I will show you in a moment. The 64 kilograms of weapons grade uranium used in the Hiroshima bomb required the discarding of 8,500 kilograms of depleted uranium. So there's an enormous amount of this depleted uranium material. And that's what the future of the military and the nuclear industry peacefully depend upon going forward if they want to have longevity. Now, you would think that depleted uranium is of no use. Well, it has almost no civilian use, but it plays a very important military role. Many of you know that they use depleted uranium in conventional munitions to make them, to create a radioactive battlefield, which is a horrible thing in itself and very stupid and should be forbidden, but isn't. Uh, however, many people don't know that it's very important in the manufacture of nuclear weapons as well. This woman is sampling a, a depleted uranium derby in preparation for building nuclear H-bombs. This woman is packing tubes of depleted uranium metal, which have been fabricated. These become the targets that make the plutonium for the H-bomb triggers. It's actually the uranium-238 that creates plutonium, not the explosive uranium-235. So U-238 is the fertile material that gives rise to the plutonium. And here is the result. That plutonium trigger ignites an enormous fusion reaction, creating a 15 million ton nuclear test in the South Pacific. The Hiroshima bomb was only 15, when I say 15 million tons, I mean 15 million tons of TNT. Uh, the Hiroshima bomb was only 15,000 tons of TNT. So a large modern nuclear weapon can be 10 to 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. They don't make them that small anymore. The Hiroshima bombs, they don't make them that small anymore. They're all bigger than that. Uh, most of the explosive power, however, you might be amazed to find out, 
is from the fissioning of uranium-238. It turns out that the overwhelming, the lion's share of the explosive power is from the depleted uranium that's left over. And a lot of that depleted uranium is from civilian nuclear fuel. When the civilian nuclear fuel is manufactured in the enrichment plant, its depleted uranium goes into the backyard and the military just helps itself. So there's a direct physical connection between our uranium trade and uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear explosions. And most of the nuclear fallout from the H-bomb is also from the fissioning of the U-238. Now, turning to the security threats of nuclear power, one of the first threats that you should imagine is acts of warfare. Way back in 1976, Sir Brian Flowers, a nuclear physicist from the UK, warned that if nuclear power had been developed prior to World War II and had been deployed in several European countries, then large parts of Europe would be uninhabitable today. Because of conventional warfare, just the aerial bombardment and the sabotage that goes with war would release huge quantities of fission products and other radioactive materials and would make that uh, land unusable for human purposes. You couldn't grow food that was healthy to eat on it. Now, put the second point about civilian nuclear power is that it's always continually producing plutonium. The creation of plutonium in a nuclear reactor occurs when an atom of uranium-238 absorbs a neutron and instead of fissioning, because this is a low energy neutron, it simply absorbs the neutron and becomes a little heavier and turns into plutonium-239. So that plutonium-239, every atom of plutonium started out as an atom of uranium. Now, uh, in order to get the plutonium out of the spent fuel, you have a problem. There's a radioactive firewall. I call it a firewall because any human being within one meter of, of an irradiated fuel bundle would be dead in a matter of days if they stayed there for more than a minute. Uh, that's because of the intense radiation. You simply drop down dead before you could uh, carry it off in order to get the plutonium out of it. So what the industry, the civilian nuclear industry wants to do, and this is happening even in New Brunswick here in Canada, is they want to make it easier by building a reprocessing plant. What a reprocessing plant does is it, it removes and eliminates the firewall. So that now, and the purpose for doing this is that they also want to have access to the plutonium because they can use it as nuclear fuel and extend their job security for 24,000 years. But if it recycled into a reactor, it can just as equally be recycled into an atomic bomb. And so this reprocessing is very dangerous for the future. Imagine a world in which we have successfully eliminated nuclear weapons, and yet we're allowing this technology. It means that any country can have its own stockpile of plutonium and build, build the nuclear weapons on the side and just have everything ready to go. Just put Insert A into insert tab A into slot B, and you've got a nuclear bomb. Now, the enrichment of uranium, uh, natural uranium is pictured on the left. It's only 0.7% uranium 235. Some of the new so called small modular reactors, which are misnomers, they want to use fuel that's almost 20% uh, U 235. Again, U 235 being the explosive variety. Now, weapons normally use 90%, but you could make a weapon with 20%. 20% is considered arbitrarily as a cutoff point between weapons usable and not weapons usable. To go from natural uranium to 20% is to increase the concentration of U-235, the explosive type, by a factor of 30. To go from 20% to 90% is to increase it by another factor of only four and a half. So the lion's share of getting weapons grade uranium has already been done when you go to 20% uranium. And that means that the civilian nuclear reactor is making it easier for criminal organizations, terrorist groups, or governments of any description to get their hands on the fundamental thing, which is the highly enriched uranium with which the bombs are easy to make. So number five, the risk of, of civilian nuclear power can be summarized by closing the fuel chain. And they even talk about this. They, they call it the fuel cycle. And that gives away their thinking because it's not a cycle. The most obvious thing about it is it's not a cycle. It starts with mining uranium ore and it ends up with radioactive waste that you're supposed to dispose of supposedly. But they don't want that. They want a cycle because they want to get the plutonium out by reprocessing 
They want to enrich the uranium and they want to therefore facilitate, not intentionally perhaps, but inevitably facilitate the building of atomic bombs by making the raw materials for those bombs more readily available. How can you tolerate a world in which everybody has their own stash of, of nuclear explosive material? All it takes is a matter of political will to put, to put it all together. Now, I'd like to give an object lesson here, and that's the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Many people don't pay any attention to Article 5. Article 5 promises, so promises all states in the world that they can have, app, they can have um, access to nuclear explosions as long as they use them for peaceful purposes. This is written right into the treaty, and the charge for the explosive devices used will be as low as possible. So in other words, we're supposed to be obliged to give people nuclear bombs as long as they use them for only peaceful purposes. When India exploded its atomic bomb in 1974, it claimed that it was a peaceful nuclear explosive, and that's why it was not violating any treaties or any agreements. But in fact, this, the, the lesson here is that even binding clauses in a written treaty can be disregarded by mutual consent. When people realize that this is contrary to common sense, they simply disregard it. So this, this clause in the existing treaty that it just came into force, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which guarantees that people can have access to nuclear power, I think that can also in the future be disregarded if people see the common sense of undermining the very nuclear weapons free world that they're trying to create. Uh, final point, let's tell our leaders, suicide is not a defense. And let's tell them also that suicide is not an energy policy either. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. That's just great. Um, if you can turn off your screen share now. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to um, ask our uh, the moderator of the Q&A, uh, if everyone else can mute themselves except Brenane. Um, Brenane, um, I know you've been monitoring the questions. Are you ready to ask some questions? Yes, thanks very much, Susan. Uh, we've got many questions and great questions and quite varied. So uh, they're being upvoted, some of them as we go. So perhaps we could just launch in and uh, I'll try to combine where there's some themes, but uh, might we might have a little bit of overlap here. So the first question, uh, it's a general question and I'll, I'll pose the question and then Sarah and then Susan can refer it to a panelist where no one has been identified in particular. Uh, the first question, very timely, can you update on the position of the US about the UN treaty since Biden became president? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go take a look and see if I can see all the panelists. Z, I'm wondering um, if that would be an appropriate question for you. Uh, have you been following that one? Can you say anything about um, the situation of the treaty and the Biden administration? Um, I think Ray probably uh, follows this more closely than oh. I do. So um, I would defer to uh, Ray's uh, perspective on this first. Go ahead, Ray, thank you. Uh, sure. So as far as we know right now, there hasn't been a change of position from the Biden administration on the TPNW. Um, we saw yesterday that uh, the new strategic arms reduction treaty with Russia has been extended for five years. Um, so that really, um, you know, at least cements in the status quo, but it really puts us to where things were in 2016. Um, and so now we will be of course, putting pressure on the Biden administration to change its position around the TPNW um, to not be hostile towards it. Um, but I think it is important to remember that the Obama administration opposed the negotiation of this treaty. Um, and so we're going to be working to make sure that the position doesn't go back to the Obama era position, um, but uh, goes further on, on it. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Ray. So if I might just add uh, yes. two all observations. Um, one is that um, there has emerged in the last year or so um, a position in uh, some circles in the US policy process that the US should move to a position 
away from outright hostility to the ban treaty, which is what we saw with the Trump administration, as Ray mentioned, actively asking countries to unsign um, towards a position of at best benign neglect, which is to say, if you want to do this, go ahead, it will make no difference, but we won't try and undo what it is, whatever it is that you do, because as far as we're concerned, it makes no difference. But at the same time, as Ray mentioned, there is a growing groundswell of activism in the United States raising this issue. And we saw recently, for example, that uh, uh, doomsday clock of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which was reset this morning, uh, actually mentions uh, and in its own way welcomes the coming of the Prohibition Treaty, as did an article by former US Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, uh, urging the United States to support the ban treaty, even if it's not ready to do so. And prestigious organizations like the Arms Control Association and others have said the US should seek a position of constructive engagement with ban treaty countries with regard to a focus on humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons and to recognize that a prohibition of nuclear weapons is going to be required. And if the US is not ready for it, it shouldn't at least try and block a conversation about it. So I think that the most we can expect from the Biden administration is an embrace of this position of benign neglect with some elements of the elite debate moving towards a position of constructive engagement, but right, not Sammy. outright support. Okay, Sammy, thank you. Can I add a, one comment to that? Go ahead, Gordon. I do think that like the fall of apartheid, like the fall of the Soviet uh, uh, empire, I think that it's a question of political pressure being brought to bear from many different sides. The members of NATO can play a very important role here. NATO, none of the NATO members have signed the treaty, and the reason is because NATO has a policy of having nuclear weapons and being willing to use them, even to be the first to use them in the event of a, 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 a warfare situation. So if, if the NATO members could work on NATO's policy, that would reflect back on the United States and bit by bit, it would become a matter of shame rather than a matter of pride to have any kind of nuclear weapons capability. This is really where this treaty is going in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm wondering, um, Bernane, if there's a question from the UK that you could line up. I don't know if you have one ready now, but maybe the next question. So do you have a question lined up now? Sure, we could go to a question. Uh, we have a question for uh, David Laurie. Uh, there are plans for a Chinese reactor at Bradwell built by CGN. Uh, and the questioner, uh, Anthony, is wondering for uh, what is wondering about your views, uh, given the interest in the UK, uh, and now on SMR and the pending security investment bill. Um, what do you foresee the outcome if SMR was adopted and particularly in light of this bill? Well, first of all, the CGN, which is the China um, General Nuclear Company, which is owned by the Chinese government, uh, is intending to build a gigawatt size reactor at Bradwell, not a a uh, small modular reactor. Otherwise, Gordon Edwards correctly pointed out that small is the wrong word for a modular reactor. They're, they're about half the size physically of the gigawatt reactor. Um, CGN is not only a builder of nuclear power plants in China, but it's also a builder of nuclear weapons in China. So it would be very odd for the United Kingdom government to welcome into the country a company that is a uh, already in the Chinese military program. So my suspicion is that in the long term, uh, that uh, project won't ever get uh, off the ground because of political op opposition, both from right-wing uh, conservative politicians in parliament who just don't like China for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and also because in the end, um, the Chinese want uh, co-financing for the plant. At the moment, the projected cost of that plant is something like 25 billion pounds, something like 34 billion US dollars. I don't think it's likely to be uh, ever supported as a as a genuine financial project. The only way it could go ahead, in my view, is if the Chinese decide to use it as a so-called loss leader. If they want a foothold in Western Europe, they build one plant and with that they can build follow-up plants either in the UK or elsewhere, but I think that's a long way down the road. So my current judgment would be there's a lot of propaganda going around about the plant. The nuclear industry in the UK is desperate at the moment, as I mentioned, um, the Japanese just pulled out completely from the plant uh, Anglesey in North Wales. Um, the Hitachi company uh, 
pulled out and it was formally closed today. They, they no longer are interested in building anything on, on Anglesey. And I think the UK nuclear industry is contracting to almost to the point of zero because we have one plant ongoing at uh, Hinkley C. Uh, its costs are rising. Its uh, final completion date is, is um, disappearing long into the, into the future. And I think uh, we're more likely to see the nuclear industry uh, fade out rather than expand in the UK. Thank you, David, for that. Great. Um, Bernane, do you have a, another question lined up? Uh, I do. I, I'm actually going to combine a couple of questions. A question from Julia uh, asking about verification or monitoring programs in the context of her concern about corruption and the effectiveness of monitoring uh, in that context. And a question from Adele about the IAEA inspections uh, and serious concerns uh, about uh, safety concerns that have arisen in the past and the lack of a strong internal system. Uh, so the question in general is, if, if panelists could comment on the quality and the challenges within third party verification uh, in both conventional and SMR plants uh, and in nuclear weapon countries, as well as those who claim to not have an interest in a weapons program. So just a comment generally on the verification program, its effectiveness and its uh, weaknesses in light of proliferation and SMR concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go through the panelists in the order that they spoke and see if they'd like to say anything. Um, Ray, would you like to say anything about that first? No, I think I'll defer to the others. Okay, thanks. Okay, Zia, do you have any comments on that? Um, I can make a few observations. Um, the first is that um, it's important to remember that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has monitoring and inspection obligations on non-nuclear weapon states, but not on nuclear weapon states. Even on the civilian programs in nuclear weapon states, there is no monitoring obligation to show that they are in fact civilian. And it's also worth noting that at the time that the treaty was agreed in 1968, and it entered into force in 1970, there was actually no system of comprehensive safeguards that actually existed or had been successfully developed. The model safeguards agreement was not completed until 1973, three years after the NPT had already entered into force. And as I mentioned, it didn't apply to civilian programs in nuclear weapon states. And the story of verification under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty since then has been one of increasingly seeing the limits of safeguards and having to catch up with what states do after the fact. There were no conventional safeguards programs applied to centrifuge enrichment plants for enriching uranium because they were not around at that time and they had to be developed after the fact. Um, we also saw that some countries that were signatories of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty like Iraq, Syria, Libya and Iran also undertook activities that were seen as safeguards violations but are only discovered after the fact. And it wasn't until the 1990s that a new set of measures on top of what were previously comprehensive safeguards had to be developed, known as the additional protocol. And so that tells you that between 1970 and the mid 1990s, what we thought were comprehensive safeguards actually turned out to be inadequate for the purpose that they had been set up. And so we have a new set of measures, but they are not mandatory on all states. States can choose to have them or not choose to have them. And so the jury is still open as to how well in the long term and under what kinds of circumstances the limits of this larger system of expanded monitoring and safeguards, uh, even under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty will actually work. Thank you. Thank you, Zia. Um, Bernane, I'm wondering if we have a question from Canada that I could give, we could give to Gordon and then- um, I'd like to comment on that last one, actually. Okay. Um, I think this is one of the most important realizations that is coming to the fore and that we all should be aware of. And that is that you can't allow peaceful nuclear explosives because it's just a question of intent as to whether you use it for peace or for war. And if everybody has their own stash of nuclear weapons, how can you have a nuclear disarmed world? It doesn't make any sense. So even though it's in the treaty, the non-proliferation treaty, they've done away with that. Under the Obama administration, it also came to the head that you can't afford to allow people to have stashes of highly enriched uranium. 
because a highly enriched uranium can be used in such a simple bomb that again, there's no timely warning. So you can't have uh, proper uh, safeguards in, when there's no warning time. So uh, that's why Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, the original Prime Minister Trudeau, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, in 1978 addressed the United Nations Disarmament Conference at the UN General Assembly. And he said, we need a strategy of suffocation. We need to choke off the vital oxygen on which the arms race, the nuclear arms race feeds. And that means highly enriched uranium and weapons grade plutonium. Well, I would go further. We have to chalk off the two technologies which make these materials available or can be used to make these material, materials available. And that's uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. But if you choke those two off, you essentially mean the end of the civilian nuclear power industry because you can't succeed otherwise. This realization has got to be, uh, I think, something that we all should cultivate because we're talking here about the fate of the earth. We're talking here about the fate of the planet. We could render the planet unlivable in a matter of hours using nuclear weapons. It doesn't take as long as climate change takes. So we've got to really highlight that this is a, an existential problem, even more urgent than climate change. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm wondering, um, since Ray passed on that question, if you have a, a question, Brene, in that uh, about the TPNW or... No, I have the other question queued. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead, and then you can find one. <laughs> oh, so I've combined three questions. I'm going to come back to that one next. But okay. I've combined a couple of questions, and then a more specific question for uh, Gordon and follow up to a uh, comment from him asking about the longevity of some of the uh, some of the products uh, in uh, from both mining and fission. And what's the time period for isolation required? Uh, how long must these materials be isolated from the environment? So I'll pass that one to Gordon and, and uh, queue up a question for, uh, for Ray. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, so that's about the longevity. Uh, let's just talk about the military since that's the focus of the uh, Treaty on the Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. I've made a little chart of how many, how many plutonium-based bombs you could make, and there's tens of thousands of them from existing stocks of can do spent fuel. If you put it underground and wait for almost a million years, you can still build thousands of you can still build hundreds of nuclear weapons from the plutonium uh, alone in those ways. So we're talking here about very, very, uh, you know, essentially forever uh, in, in terms of the weapons danger. But there's also something that many people don't realize, and that is that every atom of uranium-239 uh, disintegrates into an atom of uranium-235, which is also weapons usable. And uranium-235 has a 700 million year half-life. So in fact, the idea that plutonium disappears after 240,000 years or whatever it is, is not really true. It does disappear, but it's changed into uranium-235, which is the other, principal primary nuclear explosive. So it's essentially a perpetual problem. We have to stop producing it and we have to really collect together and figure out how to safely store or, or uh, under international control, we have to keep this dangerous material out of the hands of future regimes as well as uh, dangerous people today. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm gonna go with that question for Ray, if you could read that, Brene. Right, thanks. There is a question directly for Ray. Uh, it's from Anne asking if Ray could comment on uh, feminist and feminist indigenous resurgence of focus on nuclear, uh, on nuclear issues, both nuclear power, its collect connection to nuclear weapons, and women, peace, and security agenda. And Ray, if you, if you could also comment on that, perhaps in the uh, context of the treaty and the, the uh, treaty discussions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the anti-nuclear movement has long been a feminist movement and um, certainly women and indigenous leaders have been at the forefront, um, both against nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Um, so this certainly isn't something that's new, but I think what um, is remarkable about the development of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the process to achieve it was the attention that was paid to 
diversity um, in within the negotiations and within the, the conferences on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons leading up to the negotiations. And so there was a concerted effort, both on the activist side through ICANN, but also on the diplomatic side to ensure diverse representation. Um, the Irish government set up a sponsorship fund um, specifically to fund um, young women diplomats from countries of the global south to be able to attend the humanitarian impact conferences, as well as meetings in Geneva and New York um, that were part of the process to ban nuclear weapons. Um, there was also uh, invitations to indigenous speakers um, from the governments that hosted the humanitarian impact conferences um, to invite um, impacted folks from impacted communities in the United States, in Australia, in the Marshall Islands, um, in Japan, and other places. Um, so there was more effort than we've ever seen um, within the process. And this resulted in the most progressive language that we've seen in, um, in a nuclear weapon treaty or agreement uh, at the international level. Um, the TPNW recognizes the disproportionate impacts of nuclear weapon activities on indigenous populations. It recognizes the suffering of the Hibaksha, um, it recognizes the gendered impacts as well of ionizing radiation on women and girls. That was thanks in large part to the work of Mary Olson, bringing this to the attention of, of the negotiators. Um, and it also calls for uh, the participation, gender diverse participation in nuclear disarmament and arms control in the future. Um, so there was, there was a lot of new ground that was really broken with this treaty um, beyond the biggest new ground, of course, that it prohibits nuclear weapons, um, but all of these other things are extremely important to helping us shift the discourse and change the view of who's a credible expert on nuclear weapon issues. And so I think that's why it's so important also to do the same within the conversation around nuclear power. Thanks. Great, thank you. And it's a question for, uh, for David Laurie, but uh, it relates to a, a broader question I think we have around international uh, collaboration among both industry and the regulators. Uh, the question is around New Scale, uh, who possibly have an interest in the Wilfa site, uh, and they have had their SMR, SMNR design licensed in the US. So what are the implications for uh, North Wales of that? And so maybe if we could start with, with uh, a response from David, but I think the broader question is, what are the implications of this uh, uh, collaborative licensing uh, exercises among regulators for so-called small modular reactors? So David. I think the small modular reactor um, vendors or, or would be vendors uh, have seen an opportunity in um, filling in what they see as a market gap because of the uh, global push for uh, climate change initiatives. And they have argued erroneously and factually and accurately that they are a carbon free or zero carbon technology. In terms of regulators, I can't speak for regulators globally, but in the UK, I know that the UK um, Office for Nuclear Regulation has been looking at uh, generic reactor designs from SMRs and so-called um, advanced nuclear technology reactors for uh, several years. Uh, they have been um, inviting uh, the generic designs to be uh, presented to them so they can make a generic judgment about the uh, possibility of providing a license for these plants. Um, I tried to uh, obtain the internal uh, records of their um, committee meetings uh, and, and uh, review meetings to see the ways in which they were actually undertaking this pre-regulatory procedure. Um, it, they're supposed to respond to you in, in 21 days. It took them 18 months to come back to me. I had to make endless reapplications for information. Uh, they finally produced a set of documentation and it's pretty obvious that there's behind the scenes collaboration between uh, SMR promoters and the UK nuclear regulator, which I do not regard as appropriate. Um, 
and it's an ongoing battle to ensure that the UK nuclear regulator stands apart from the industry and regulates it rather than promotes it, which is what I think it does partly, particularly um, when uh, part of its money is coming from the industry. Thank you, David. Um, I wanted to give uh, Linda Pence Gunter a, a chance to say something here. Oh, thank you, Susan. Actually, um, I had just a follow-up question for Ray. Um, building on what you mentioned about the treaty and the fact that it specifically recognizes the disproportionate impact on women and children. Um, that's been a facet of our campaign on nuclear power and that women are disproportionately impacted by routine releases and, and obviously accidents. And, and whether there's a way, you know, since we were talking about how we might translate the success of the TPNW uh, messaging, especially from the humanitarian impacts, but specifically from the feminist point of view, uh, how we might use that in the anti-nuclear power campaigning to, to reinforce that more strongly, because it, it tends to be, you know, a hard sell and there's a lot of denial about the health impacts. And um, so I've just wondered if you had any thoughts on how we could steal that idea and use it better for our own work. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it was kind of, it was interesting to me to see how it really shocked many governments um, who had never heard uh, that there was a gender dimension of, of nuclear weapon and ionizing radiation. Um, and so I think that that knowledge in itself is quite powerful. Um, I think it's also really important in any of this work to be careful not to just create a picture of women as victims, of course. Um, and, you know, we don't want to reinforce the sort of women need protecting, so we need to do this. Um, and that was also something for us in the nuclear weapon um, ban treaty that we had to be cognizant of, which is why it's important in the treaty that the treaty also recognizes the participation of women in um, discussions and negotiations around nuclear weapons so that it wasn't just a framing of, of women as victims. So that's one thing I would say is a, is a lesson learned to, to pay attention to. Um, but I think overall, anything that really points out disproportionate harm um, is very useful. Um, I think there's more cognizance today than ever before of the intersectionality of a lot of these issues and how different identities and experiences overlap in terms of oppressions and suffering of specific groups of people. And I think it's really important to um, acknowledge also not just the disproportionate harms to women, but also to indigenous communities and looking at the ways in which in the United States, for example, when it's come to nuclear weapon testing, um, the standard reference again, the same way it's it's men, a standard, standard man, um, white American male, middle-aged, um, is, is used as the reference for everything. So it doesn't take into account diet or geology in terms of where people are living, what they're eating, how, how they're existing in the world. And so raising any of those types of considerations, I think are really useful to making the humanitarian impacts of either nuclear weapons or nuclear power more resonant to more people. Thank you, Ray. And thanks for that question, Linda. Right, we have uh, just under 10 minutes left. Um, and I wanted to give all the panelists an opportunity to, uh, after everything you've heard, any, any concluding thoughts. So we'll go in reverse order. Uh, Gordon, I'll leave it to you, just a minute or two, to a final thoughts that you'd like to share. Yes, I, I think we should focus our minds not on fear, but on common sense and the fact that we have only one Earth and that we are all sort of a crewmates on this spaceship Earth. And if we, we can't afford to shoot at each other, we're gonna blow up the spaceship and ruin everything setting back 4 billion years of evolution. So we gotta, we gotta really get at this nuclear question and make people see that it's an existential crisis. Thank you, Gordon. Um, David, would you like to go next? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, my fellow panelists for the contributions they have made in their careers uh, on the subject. Um, all of them have made fantastic um, contributions and produce fantastic work. 
and I want to recognize that publicly. Um, I'd like to just make one comment about the question that was asked about safeguards and to say that safe, uh, the nuclear industry uses language in a very misleading fashion. Uh, you might recall that the, the, the um, Soviet Union's um, first nuclear weapons program was, was called the Ministry of Medium-Sized Machines, make it as obscure as you could get. Uh, nuclear safeguards are not safe and they don't guard mostly. Uh, I'll just give you one example. In the UK, um, Azir is right to say that there weren't safeguards agreements signed for the nuclear weapon states within the NPT, but towards the end of the 1970s, they all signed so-called voluntary safeguards agreements. I would call them involuntary voluntary safeguards agreements. They were politically pressurized to do so, so they could show that they would have the equal misery of um, uh, disruption of their civilian facilities uh, along with the non-nuclear weapon states. The UK has such a, an agreement. It's uh, been in force for just over 40 years. Uh, it, has a, an ex it has a withdrawal clause uh, in the UK uh, um, treaty, it's Article 14. Uh, it, it allows the UK government to withdraw nuclear materials from um, declaration and the safeguards if it wants to for so-called national security reasons. Just to demonstrate uh, that it doesn't safeguard at all, in the 40 year period since uh, September of 1978, when this agreement came into force, the UK government has actively withdrawn nuclear materials in, in excess of uh, for, for, uh, 620 times. So it just goes to show you that um, although politicians uh, shower around the words nuclear safeguards, you really have to understand what they actually do and keep in your mind they're not safe and they don't guard. Thank you, David. Uh, Zia, would you have any final thoughts? Um, thank you. I, you know, perhaps to circle back to something that um, Gordon and Ray mentioned, and that is that um, a lot of the discussion about nuclear weapons for a long time before the Prohibition Treaty was abstract. It was about deterrence or counting weapons and so on. And it took a long effort to try and, and embody the experience of nuclear weapons in the world. Um, to break through into uh, what led to the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I think similarly with nuclear energy, I think we have to begin from the fact that the existence of nuclear energy has to be embodied in the world from the role of uranium mining on indigenous land and the damage that it does to nature uh, through the process of uh, you know, the spent fuel and so on and management and how it colonizes the future. And so in one sense, I would say that uh, a feminist perspective is invaluable here, but so is a decolonizing perspective. That nuclear energy uh, builds on colonial legacies of who has the land and what the land means and what it means for land to have value. That it's more than just a source of extraction of minerals for you know, maintaining rich people's livelihoods but also that it colonizes the future almost indefinitely. And so I think along with the feminist perspective, I would think about trying to see about ways to build a, a decolonizing perspective in how to think about nuclear energy as a way to get to the point of uh, the kind of phase out of nuclear energy that will help sustain a nuclear weapon free world. Wonderful thoughts, Zia, thank you. Um, and Ray, do you have any final contributions you'd like to make? Sure, um, totally agree with what Zia just said, of course, um, which is why I mentioned the intersectional approach being being super important for, for all of this work. I guess overall, um, my final word would just be have hope um, and, and keep doing the work because I think if nothing else, the TPNW shows what a bunch of committed people can do working across you know, transnational boundaries, the boundaries between activists and diplomats and, and all of that, but what we can actually do when we collaborate together, even against the most powerful governments in the world who don't want us to do something, it is still possible. So have hope. Have hope. That's a great thought to end on. Thank you to all the panelists. So I just like to say uh, on behalf of the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick, 
and the Canadian Environmental Law Association and Beyond Nuclear and the New Brunswick Media Co-op, who's also a co-host that will be publishing the webinar. Um, we'd just like to thank everyone for their participation and their interest in this issue. And just to highlight uh, a theme that has come up uh, again and again, uh, it's important for everyone to act. Um, and certainly your active participation at this webinar was, was very welcome. But there are campaigns going on in all of our countries, certainly here in New Brunswick, across Canada, in the US and the UK and elsewhere. So um, if, you're, if you would like to get active and you wanna get uh, linked in and, and introduced to a group in your area, um, please do get in touch with me and I'll do my best to direct you to some local campaigns. So thanks again, everyone, um, and wish you a good year. <laughs> thanks very much. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.